happy to welcome you to the floor today. Um, she's one of the country's foremost advocates of concealed carry on campus. In 2015, Antonia made a permanent mark in the Second Amendment community when she became the Southwest Regional Director for Students for Concealed Carry on Campus, where she advocated for the passing and successful implementation of the Concealed Carry on Campus in Texas law known as Campus Carry. Uh, the National Rifle Association took notice of her activism and had her star in one of their Freedom Safest Place commercials, a national campaign that highlights the diversity of NRA members, uh, a current graduate of um, Graduate student of the University of Texas at Dallas, Antonia shows no signs of slowing down. So, thank you for joining us. Discovered something startling about myself. It turns out that I'm a racist, sexist, misogynist. This came as quite a shock to me. How did this happen? As a person of color, a single woman with a graduate degree who grew up poor in a home without a father. I had a clear political path to follow, and I followed it. I voted for Barack Obama, twice. After all, we share the same skin color. His father was from Africa, mine was too. What other reasons did I need? I was inspired to see a black man rise to the highest office in the land. I believed his ascent would herald a new beginning a new era of racial healing and harmony. We would finally have that frank discussion about race that everyone always talks about. I was also inspired by his wife. I was thrilled to see such a strong, opinionated black woman take the national stage. But then something happened, actually several somethings. I realized there was a big contradiction in my own life. I considered myself a free thinker, but I was thinking exactly what I was supposed to. I decided to start asking questions. I belonged to several campus feminist groups. I was even teaching feminism to inner city girls. Part of that teaching involved making the case for abortion. These girls needed to know that they had the right to make decisions about their own bodies. Surely, I thought, that's empowerment. But one day I asked myself, isn't it men who benefit most from consequence-free sex? Doesn't that give them even more power over women? And of course, abortion certainly doesn't empower the woman it prevents from ever being born. When I began to ask my other feminist friends how they reconcile these issues, they just got angry. I was called anti-woman, even by progressive men. But I'm not anti-woman, I thought. I am a woman. I just don't want to be a weak one. I want to be strong, like Michelle. At about the same time, while I was a student at the University of Texas at Dallas, the UT Austin Department of African Diaspora Studies released a statement in which they said, and I quote, African Americans are disproportionately affected by the saturation of our society by firearms. We demand that firearms be banned in all spaces occupied by black people on our campus. Wait a second, I thought. Why would you want to ban firearms only in black areas? Does not that mean that you either think black people are more dangerous than other people or less worthy of protection? These questions did not endear me to my progressive friends. I was called a race traitor, even by white people. But I'm not anti-black. I am black. I just want to be safe, like Barack. I realized I didn't have a good answer. I only had more questions. Like, why were blacks doing so poorly in cities that had been run by Democrats for decades? Was it racism and sexism that was holding people back? Or was it something else? The more questions I asked, the less popular I became. But here's the funny thing. I started to feel better about myself. I decided that the very definition of empowerment required me to take responsibility for my own life. I wasn't going to be anyone's victim, which meant I had to protect myself. So I bought a gun. I started to advocate for gun rights. That cost me more friends. I joined the pro-life movement and walked in a march for life. More friends, gone. Then I crossed the line. I voted Republican, the party that views me as an empowered individual, able to shape my own destiny, not as a member of a victim group. And that's how I became 
a racist, sexist, misogynist. I'm Antonia Okafor for Prager University. Hey guys. <laughs> Well, thank you guys so much for having me here. Uh, I always like to play my Prairie U University video to Prairie U, uh, video because uh, I always get questions about how I transition from a full-fledged Obama voting Democrat to what I am today. So, um, but again, so thank you guys so much for having me at Georgetown in DC, and I'll get started. So it's truly an honor to be standing here with you guys today. I'm honored to be leading the conversation on one of America's most fundamental rights, the right to keep and bear arms. As the founder of Empowered, a gun rights organization for women on college campuses, I spend every day of my life defending gun rights and empowering young millennial women like me to defend ourselves. Centuries ago, our founding fathers created the Second Amendment to protect American citizens from the very real threat of governmental tyranny. In those days, the threat of a British monarchy, an all-powerful government with no regard for individual liberty, dominated American hearts and minds. The threat loomed so large that it made the right to bear arms an indispensable part of the founding constitution. Without the Second Amendment, our Constitution could not, and I quote, secure the blessings of liberty to ourselves and our posterity. Centuries later, the Second Amendment continues to secure those blessings, but it is under attack. While we no longer face the threat of a British monarchy, mm -hmm. Our right to bear arms is besieged on what seems like a daily basis. Today, the threat to freedom primarily comes from within. Anti-gun activists and legislators who would strip Americans of their God-given right to defend themselves and their families. Their anti-gun activism, their obsession with gun control has reached a fever pitch in the aftermath of the Parkland shooting. When one evil man, evil man, took 17 innocent lives from us. Most of them were students only a few years younger than we are. And we keep them in our hearts today. Since that tragedy, we have seen the best of American society we have seen a local community come together, joined by people across the country and around the world who continue to stand with them today. But we have also seen the worst of American society. We have seen grieving victims scapegoat innocent bystanders, laying blame at the feet of the National Rifle Association and other gun owners. We have seen millions of NRA members and law-abiding gun owners vilified as if they are the school shooters themselves, as if they have blood on their hands. We have seen pro-gun legislators and activists called, and I quote, domestic terrorist enablers. We have seen the Second Amendment called a suicide pact. At the heart of such divisive rhetoric is the idea that gun control will make evil go away. It's a misguided idea that the fewer guns there are, the safer our communities become. That simply isn't true. The fewer guns there are, the weaker our Second Amendment becomes. The less safe we are. The fewer guns there are, the easier it becomes for evil people to commit evil crimes. Since the late 1990s, more than 96% of mass public shootings occurred in gun-free zones, where the shooter has free reign to fire away 
while victims have virtually no power to defend themselves. 96%. The gun-free designation cannot stop a single school shooting and has failed to protect students too, too many times. Why? Because nothing stops a bad guy with a gun except a good guy or girl with a gun. In the United States, guns are used as many as 2.5 million times a year in self-defense, preventing countless tragedies from ever becoming a new story. Disarming law-abiding Americans won't stop evil people. Arming them will, as I tell fellow millennials every day. Let me take you back to 2013, to the state of Georgia, when a shooter opened fire at Prince Middle, Prince Middle School in Atlanta, putting numerous lives in jeopardy. He was stopped and those lives were spared. He left no victims, no grieving families in his wake. How? It happened because a school shooter was disarmed by an armed guard stationed at the school. A good guy with a gun. In the end, the shooter only wounded one student. The rest dodged a bullet many of them. Just a few weeks ago, an Illinois man with an AR-15 rifle stopped a knife attack on another person, saving his life. It wasn't a miracle that saved him. It was a gun. Without that AR-15, without the Second Amendment to protect us, that knife attack could have been lethal. As we recover from the Parkland tragedy, we must learn from these good Samaritans and their inspiring acts of bravery. We must empower gun owners, especially concealed carry owners, to defend themselves and their communities. And we must eliminate the gun-free zones that continue to make our communities more dangerous. Last year, a female student was kidnapped at gunpoint at the University of Las Vegas, Nevada. She was sexually assaulted at a separate location, only getting away after she grabbed her assailant's gun and fled. If the victim was allowed to carry her gun, she could have defended herself. Why wasn't she allowed to have her gun? Instead, she had to reach for his, the criminals. It wasn't the first time a campus tragedy could have been prevented. In 2008, a very good dear friend of mine, Amanda Collins, a UNLV student and concealed carry permit holder, was raped by a serial rapist in a UNLV parking garage. That same rapist would go on to rape and murder a young woman after Amanda. Again, why wasn't she allowed to conceal carry? Why wasn't she allowed to defend herself? The proper response to Parkland and similar tragedies is not to establish more gun-free zones. It is not to take away our weapons of self-defense. It is to implement policies that deter would-be criminals from preying on the defenseless. Say this with me. Evil knows no age limit. Evil knows no age limit. Thank you, guys. <laughs> good job. But, God, but good can win if we arm ourselves. I was a college student not so long ago, so believe me when I say that our colleges and universities need campus carry protections. From the University of Texas massacre in 1966 to the Oregon Community College shooting in 2015, 
We have seen mass shooters carry out some of the worst crimes imaginable on our campuses. That's why I spend my days fighting for campus carry, because it works. Empowering properly trained gun owners has already proven to be successful in states like Texas, Georgia, Arkansas, and Kansas. Speaking of Kansas, after the University of Kansas allowed students to conceal carry handguns last year, the campus saw a 13% decrease in crime, which comes out to roughly 100 fewer criminal cases. That's only after six months. What we cannot do is make it more difficult for law-abiding citizens to defend themselves and others. Remember the millions of law-abiding gun owners who have gone through multiple layers of requirements to obtain and keep their permits. We cannot infringe on their Second Amendment rights and leave ourselves vulnerable to bad guys with guns. Earlier this month, the Florida legislator, the same legislator that has failed over and over again to pass campus carry, passed a law banning the sale of firearms for those age 21 years of age or younger. This is not only a mistake, but a direct attack on our right to self-defense. We cannot succumb to pressure from gun control advocates whose misguided policies punish law-abiding gun owners while doing nothing to stop criminals from breaking the law. We cannot be seduced by false gun control narratives which suggests guns are evil and not evil itself. When we, the people, ignore our founding fathers and undermine our constitutional rights, we fail our country. I've spent years supporting and defending our Second Amendment right and empowering gun owners to exercise their constitutional rights. As a millennial, I take it upon myself to advocate for students who believe in gun rights, but whose voices have not been heard. And as a woman, I take it upon myself to advocate for other women, many of whom, like me, have experienced the horror of sexual assault, to defend themselves by arming themselves. Above all else, as an American, I take it upon myself to stand up for the defenseless who are only a gun away from taking back control of their lives. I ask you to stand with me and stand up for all of us. Thank you. Right, with that, I'll take questions. So, so first of all, as someone who will be um, attending University of Texas Law School in the fall, okay. and I have a concealed carry permit back home that's recognized in Texas, thank you very much for your advocacy because it's going to have a tangible impact on me. Uh, that's in the fall. great. So thank you very much for that. Uh, my question is, here at Georgetown, we have this nonsense gun-free zone policy where even our campus police are not armed. Wow. And if anything were to happen, I'm just really curious to... What would happen, you know, the worst case scenario? So I'm kind of curious to your thoughts on the effectiveness of Georgetown's total gun-free policy where even our campus police are armed with flashlights and batons, and their primary job as a police force is to dial 911. <laughs> I think you said it pretty well for all of us, but yeah, absolutely. I mean, we just have to look at these places where those who are supposed to be protecting us don't have the means to protect us. Um, even looking at Florida, I'm not talking about to say the cowards who didn't come in and protect those students, but the brave teachers within those within that school who obviously loved their students, who obviously wanted to protect them, but they had no way of protecting their students except for using their bodies and their desks, and that's a travesty. So the same thing with this, the fact that we think that because this man or woman has a uniform, and therefore you know, the criminal doesn't care or, or cares that that person does, and that's going to be enough for us, we're living, in, we're living in this type of dreamlike world where we think nothing's going to happen to us until something happens to us. And that's the danger that we're in, is this complacency that we're okay. So 
Absolutely, I think it's wrong. I was at Mount Holyoke, and I remember right after uh, Hampshire College uh, canceled my speech two hours before I was supposed to speak, and it became um, a big news um, story that I was really concerned because they weren't. They said, "Oh, well, for this type of or this type of event, we're gonna have pepper spray um, on us because this is a special event." I'm like, "Okay, great, thanks. I have pepper spray. I didn't tell them that, but uh, <laughs> I'm just as armed as you are." So. You're, Really, you're you're not able to do anything if something happens. So I think that's that's the travesty of that is that here we are, these people that we designate right by the state. If we think the state is the one that designates everything, that these people are not even trustworthy enough to be able to protect my life, even though that's their role and their duty. Thank you. Thanks for bringing that up. Yeah. Um, <clears throat> in your example of the person, good guy with the gun, stopping a bad guy with a gun, you talked about a trained professional who was hired to protect the school. Mm -hmm. I want to know how does that logic translate to arming all civilians present? That person was paid to defend the school. Right, well, obviously I was going to say with Florida, just because somebody's paid to defend the school doesn't mean that they're going to do so. But I think it comes down to if someone's willing to go through the training and the requirements, which there are many of them, to be a concealed carry permit holder, um, that they should have every right, just as anybody else, to be able to protect their lives and, and those that they care about. And if it's in a school setting, what better way than those people, who, so someone who is going to be willing to use their own body to protect those students. So I think it comes down to if you have passed the necessary background checks, if you've done what you need to do and you're a diligent, uh, responsible gun owner who is going to get the training necessary in order to defend your life with other people, so why don't you give that person that opportunity to do so? Um, so I concerned for a uh, congressman from Florida, and a lot of the calls that we've been getting from constituents are obviously about gun control, and they're all about you know like oh I'm pro Second Amendment but we need more gun control or we got stuff for gun control loophole or we got to ban assault rifles stuff like that. Yeah. So obviously they don't they're not they're just very ignorant to the the topic of guns and the Second Amendment and all the stats that you listed uh, in your speech. So I think that the best way to kind of change people's minds and attitudes towards the Second Amendment would, is through education. Like, if everyone heard your speech, then I think a lot of people would change their mind and come to realization. Um, but my question is, is how, how do you do that, like, on a mass scale? Because so many people, especially millennials, yeah. just believe what they hear, and they buy into, you know, someone else's, you know, belief that the Second Amendment is outdated and evil. Yeah. Um, so obviously, like, coming to Georgetown and giving these speeches is a great way to help, but what's, like, in your opinion, like, the best way to do that like, on a mass scale? Yeah, well, I think it comes, I think it's not the, the sexy answer, um, but it's kind of what I've been doing, you know, is going to different college campuses. For me, it's my, I'm passionate about advocating for students. Because I don't believe that you guys are, <laughs> you guys are looked down upon in, in every sense of the word. Sorry, guys, um, but it's true. Unless you're, you know, you're going into school and you're the rising star and you're making the money by, you know, becoming the new prospective student, um, they they don't think that you can actually use or be able to have the same rights that someone else um, should have, right? So um, they don't really care about your about your rights, and someone needs to advocate for them. So I think part of that is that. We have to make sure that those who are able to stand up and speak out for those different groups, whether that you're passionate about students, you're passionate about K through 12, or you're passionate about women, um, that those people stand up and they go to different places to talk to the people about it. I think it's, the, it's not really sexy, but it's having that face to face. You know, I've had people say, well, why are you doing this tour? Why you could just literally have a 10 minute speech on YouTube and, and just, you know, do a video on it. And I think that's part of the problem is that we still think that the face-to-face -face aspect of it doesn't change minds. This is a controversial issue, and it's always going to be. Um, and so you, for you to actually be able to change someone's mind, or even someone who's on the fence, because you were saying people who are calling in saying, I'm pro-Second Amendment, but um, that's actually a lot of people that I have dealt with, especially with the campus carry issue, where people who would say, you know, I'm definitely for the Second Amendment, but I don't think my 18-year-old, or I don't think my 21-year-old is, is mature enough to be able to protect themselves on campus. And that's not true. Statistics don't show that. So 
I think is that face-to-face -face and going and talking to people. It's going to be slow, but we can't have this mass, you know, yes, we're going to talk about it, we're going to energize people, we're going to go march on D.C., you know, um, and think that that's going to be enough to change people's minds. It might energize people for a little bit, but does it really change people's minds and get people off the fence? No. And so you have that face-to-face -face conversation, you're not going to do that. Yeah. yeah. Um, so an argument that definitely a lot of people on the left like to make is that um, a lot of this self-defense can still be done uh, with handguns. Um, I'm curious what your opinion is on measures to, you know, ban assault rifles, reduce clip sizes, uh, reduce firing rate, um, bug stock ban, um, measures like that. I'm just curious what your opinion yeah, well, okay, so first, uh, I've heard, I mean, I'm not trying to take anybody out, but a lot of people think, so AR-15 does not mean assault rifle. I'm just telling you that it's Armalite. <laughs> um, it's just the guy who invented the AR-15. Um, for it to be an assault weapon, you have to have the ability to change it from a semi-automatic to a fully automatic, which AR-15 is a civilian rifle, so you're not able to do that. It's semi-automatic, which means one trigger, one round per trigger pull. So just, just those, I'm just saving the questions now, because it's okay if you don't want to speak up. Um, so I think there's a lot, like he was saying, there's a lot of misinformation out there, and I think that's part of the problem, is that people are scared of something that they don't understand. Um, I know a lot of gun control advocates I've talked to who would say, well, I'm not even, I don't even go to the gun range. Like, I have no interest in even bringing up, you know, holding a firearm or even using that. Well, then, what are you basically saying? You're saying that you don't want to educate yourself, and also you're afraid that if you do educate yourself, that maybe you change your mind. That's really what it goes down to. Um, so I think that's part of the problem right now is we have that misinformation of what those um, types of things are, and then people think, well, let's just go and you know jump in the bandwagon and try to ban all these things. Um, uh, but. The handgun case, it's funny that you bring that up because in the 80s, there was this big wave of a lot of gun control advocates who didn't want handguns. In fact, that's the reason why we have it at 21 years of age now in order to even purchase a handgun. And now they're switching it now. Oh, rifles are really where we need to go and we have to ban those. Um, for one thing, people think open carry, so it's a fun fact, open carry, the reason why there was this big wave of concealed carry um, being pushed by gun, gun advocate, gun rights advocates in the 90s is because they had actually more open carry laws on the books because gun control advocates actually wanted to see the gun on someone. They wanted to see who had a firearm. So they pushed for open carry. And now they're switching it because they said, no, 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 no. It's, it's, that's not really what we want. So. You cannot continue to look at what they want in order to see what the, the line of morality is when it comes to that because in 10 years they could absolutely switch because it has nothing to do with the actual firearm. It's that they want to ban guns altogether. When you hear someone preface, I always, when I hear somebody say this on TV or in a debate or on a panel and they say, I'm for the Second Amendment, but for the most part, they're not for the Second Amendment because they're just using that to kind of switch people's brains off and think that, oh, I don't have to listen to them after that, but you should be listening to them after that. Yeah. Oh, sorry, in the back. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> first of all, thank you for coming and speaking. I'm a big Second Amendment guy. Um, I never shot a gun until I came to college, but like my dad was in the military, so that was just part of my life growing up. Uh, and I think that, yeah, I totally agree. There's a lot of misinformation. People don't know that federally, federally licensed dealers have to do a background check, that it's illegal for felons to own a gun, that it's illegal for people who've been involuntarily committed to mental institutions. There's no gun show loophole. Yeah. Um, you have to do this. Yeah, so uh, keeping that in mind, it still seems like part of our system is failing because of the existence of these mass shootings, that sort of thing. Um, and. The, the National Review supports like the uh, the gun violence restraining orders or things like that. I was wondering what sort of conservative policy measures that we can support um, outside of maybe maybe the answer is just like we give more funds to the FBI to handle this specifically or to police departments or paying security officers every school. But I was wondering like what sort of policies can conservatives support to combat illegal gun violence? Right. Well, I think and this is going to be my libertarian coming out to me, um, but the fact that we are thinking that the answer is the FBI who 
they failed us miserably on this Florida shooting um, debacle. Um, there's a lot of transparency and accountability <coughs> issues that they need to fix, and the fact that we deflected and I mean, I know you're going to say, well, because you're part of the NRA, that's what you're saying. The reason that everyone's talking about this being the NRA's fault is, I believe, for a very good reason, and we should also be holding those systems accountable. If we're going to be limited government, then we have to keep those people accountable as well. Um, so I don't really think giving more money to the FBI is going to be really even the conservative solution, fiscally, um, or just common sense um, for, this, for this scenario. I think it comes down to... I believe that the problem is that we're focusing on thinking that what the measures are, are going to be focused on criminals who are, going to not, who are not going to follow the law regardless of the law. And instead, we really should be empowering those individuals who have statistically shown that they're able to not only handle a firearm, but they're actually safer than the general public. So in 2005, uh, the Department of Public Safety in Texas conducted a study um, for the concealed carry permit holders versus the general public. And they found that concealed carry permit holders are four and a half times less likely to commit manslaughter than the general public, and they're five times less likely to, than the general public to commit murder. So these are the people that we want to be out there and, and, and defending our lives. And what I've seen, with, even with Republicans, is that they'd rather have armed guards or law enforcement or um, you know, ex-veterans or stuff like that, but they're not willing to say that I trust that we have an individual right to defend our lives and that we should be able to properly be trained and able to do so and empower that individual to do so. So I think that's a conservative policy that we're not doing very well on the conservative Republican side and that we need to be holding back to is that empowering the individual and trusting the individual to, to protect their life. Oh, uh, yes, sorry. Yeah, um, so just this morning, my professor very confidently proclaimed to the class that she thinks um, any random 18-year-old shouldn't be able to walk into the gun store and purchase a fully automatic weapon. Uh, <laughs> and, you know, I thought to myself, well, There's yeah, so I agree. Good thing that's already <laughs> been on laws for over 20 years. Um, and so on that note, of, you know, people just not... So that's Georgetown, right? Yeah, here oh, at Georgetown but, okay. this morning, yeah. Right. Um, <laughs> uh, yeah, childhood technology there you go. psychology. <laughs> <laughs> She's an expert in everything, though. That's why she went yeah. to school. Yeah, it was, I mean, <laughs> she's, a great, she's a great professor for her subject, um, just not this. And so on that note of so many people, especially, you know, in the city environment, in a college environment, not knowing squat about guns, um, what are your suggestions for certain talking points or certain ways of bringing up the conversation that get at least some people who are closer to the, the fence to maybe listen without shooting you down or getting scared um, because they don't know anything about guns and they would never dare touch one. Yeah, and I empathize with all those people because just a few years ago, I never shot a gun. Um, I would probably be, if I was voting for Obama, basically in the end I was advocating for his policies and that was pretty much very anti-gun. And so I think most people, for one, are apathetic because they don't really have to deal with the gun issue. Um, so I think that's actually good for us because Really, it's just this big middle of people on the fence, like you were saying. Um, they just need someone to give them the facts to kind of sway them to their side. I think it's whoever gets to them first is where we're really going to make that movement. And I think the same thing with like being conservative on a college campus. Um, really, people think everyone's liberal when they come over here, or progressive when they come over here. Really, most people are apathetic. They don't really know what they believe until someone talks to them and educates them on what they actually might believe, and they might be like a me and realize that, oh, I'm actually more libertarian conservative than I thought. So I think that's part of it, is that we have to, as advocates, be mindful that everybody is someone who could be open to changing their minds. And once you have that, then, for one thing, you don't have a defense mechanism, which a lot of people are turned off by. I remember in the beginning, I started advocating, and people would just say, wow, you don't yell at me when I when you talk to me about gun rights. It's so crazy. I, like, I always have people like yelling at me. I'm like, okay, first of all, that's an issue. <laughs> um, uh, let's see if I can change that. And I think part of that is because I understand the fear behind it because I understood that I didn't wasn't knowledgeable about firearms. I wasn't knowledgeable about Second Amendment. I wasn't knowledgeable even about self defense. And I think that's what it comes down to is self defense. The people who I talk to now who have changed their mind who might be completely still on the other side when it comes to politics, 
Um, but on the gun issue, they changed their mind because they finally realized that seeing a firearm, they didn't see that as a way of only harming them, but as a way to be able to protect them. And when you change that narrative and you change that viewpoint, I think that's powerful for anybody, regardless of what political spectrum they're on. So, yeah. Yes? My question is kind of piggybacking on groups of so a couple of questions ago, but um, I'm just curious how you reconcile the, um, the when there was a 10-year ban on assault rifles, mm -hmm. that the number of deaths in mass shootings was over three times less than the following 10 years. Right, in, in this greater context of assault rifles, not only should be legal, but we should be encouraging uh, people to own them. Encouraging people to assault, to encourage assault rifles that are only military grade and go from semi-automatic to fully automatic, but that's not something that's available. Or maybe uh, what well, not the exact kind of was, but I mean, right, maybe it was AR-15 that you said. Well. But I mean, right, there's, there's, I'm just, right, these more powerful guns that are being proposed to be banned, mm -hmm. that were banned before, right, that there's data out there that suggests not necessarily that the number of violent acts will go down, but the number of deaths will go down. Well, I will say that I, I don't like to speak to something that I don't have the complete facts on. I don't know if what you just said is completely true, and that is my fault, I should know that. Um, but I will say that there have definitely been multiple times when people, civilians, have been able to defend themselves with an AR-15 or with a handgun. Um, so just as much as people would say that why do you need you don't need an AR-15 because people don't use it for hunting, for example. That's false. People use it for hunting all the time. Um, you don't need an AR-15 because people don't use it for home defense or self-defense. Actually, that's not true. Homeland um, Security um, has actually put out statistics showing that it's actually one of the better tools for home defense and for self-defense, and people use it all the time for self-defense. So I think it comes down to that, is that we can debate statistics all we want, but for one, it comes down to do you have a right to defend yourself, and how are you able best to do that? Is the best way for you to defend yourself is with an AR-15, like the Sutherland Springs man who was a former NRA instructor and defended those more lives from being lost at that church in, in South Texas, and he used a rifle to do so. Does he have a right to do so? Yes, I believe he has a right to do so, just as much as someone who has a handgun to protect someone else's life or their life. Yes. Uh, I'm also from Texas, so I appreciate the work <laughs> you've done in our state. Um, but I guess from, I guess from a different perspective, a lot of people in George has it, I guess, from my jar, I have a typical, I guess, kind of suspicion of the government. They typically you know, kind of kind of chip away a little bit at our rights, I get very you know, defensive, I suppose. And I found, especially being up here, that there, that kind of suspicion is you know, almost to the contrary, that there's such a delightful you know, image of the government as this all-powerful, all-knowing body that just seems to do everything right all the time. And to even just start a conversation, from my perspective, I have this innate suspicion in theirs, it's just completely different. So how do you kind of reconcile that this basis of kind of a different thought approach to the basis of the issue, like how, if that makes sense. I feel like with that is that I think you should put back, push back when they say that and say say that same side that says, oh, the all-powerful government is great and, and, and awesome, right? Um, but then the week beforehand they're kneeling because they believe in police brutality and, oh, wait, the police is funded by the government. And so uh, you got to make a decision here. you got to be intellectually honest. Do you believe that the government... <laughs> Um, is all-knowing and, and powerful and moral at all times and does the best thing for individual systems, individual people at all times, um, and there's no worry in the system, or do you believe that there's not? And therefore, you have to be able to defend yourself in case something happens. So I think that's part of it, bring that and push, up, push back. and say, like, okay, you believe that police are racist, right? But then you also believe that in a case of self-defense that you should just let the police protect you. Doesn't make sense. So. Thank you. Yeah. Uh, yes, sorry. I'm oh, sorry. Go ahead. Go ahead. Oh, go ahead. <laughs> oh. um, I'm not a student here, obviously. I'm just, so I'm an activist Republican from the great state of Maryland. Oh. And I grew up in Washington, D.C., so you're absolutely right. There is this rarefied air here that the government is all-knowing. And I'm just so impressed by what you had to say and by the comments here. Uh, I, I'm so impressed that there are people that really are understanding the truth about guns uh, 
yeah, at Georgetown University. I'm, I'm amazed. And I just want to say uh, two quick things. Yes. Um, I found it very interesting that when I was pulling up on the web, the march for our lives, right there was hashtag get out the vote. So this is to me, I mean, I'm dealing with, I've been testifying in Annapolis against this pro-sanctuary illegal alien bill, which again is another one of these, there's truth and then there's all the emotions. And it's, it's sort of the flip side of the same thing. There's a great deal of crime associated, a great deal of deaths, but those who are for the pro-sanctuary, which tends to be very much the non-Republican, non-Libertarian side of the equation, they don't want to see that. Mm -hmm. and, and they are pushing the vote. And so I would just encourage each and every individual here, it's all about voting people in that support the Second Amendment right and taking the opportunity whenever you can to speak to, to other you know, fellow students. Um, I find it also that the, the situation with the AK-47, I mean, I hear that all the time as well. Even my husband's like, well, and he's fairly concerned. Oh, I think, you know, handguns are okay, but, and I just look at him, I'm not a gun expert per se, I'm like, okay. So I'm thinking of someone living in a crime-infested neighborhood with a handgun, and some criminal comes up and he or she's swaying bullets right left. You don't stand a chance. Um, I mean, I think your, your data would, would certainly support that. Um, and I just, I would love to see more coming from the, the conservatives out there that we supposedly elected to put on the hill to support the Second Amendment over the stats. I mean, the, the so-called gun-safe cities. You know, Maryland's a big gun-safe city. Baltimore's out of control. Oh, yeah. Chicago's another one. Maryland's a great example. This is example. the same <laughs> argument of sanctuary cities have less crime. Well, I'm living in Montgomery County. And the, the legal Latinos, the African Americans, the minorities, in those communities where those illegal gangs are, 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 are being decimated. It's horrific what's going on. So I, I just want to thank you for what you have to say. And also another thing, I understand, I, I, I believe there's going to be at GW, the Federalist Society there is having a Second Amendment uh, panel of some sort. I think a, a gentleman who's running for DC, DC Republican chair is going to be there. I don't know much more about it, but it might be worthwhile to look into and see what they have to say and go and uh, you know, speak with others and, and join forces. And I just want to thank you for everything you said. It's been great. Thank you. Thank you. Yes. Um, well, thank you for coming. And my question, just to piggyback off of you, um, you spoke about the March for Our Lives. Do you think that the rhetoric that has been used, whether pro-gun, anti-gun, people make quick judgments about what someone believes because of this. Um, and Congress only spent a week on the issue itself. Even though obviously Americans throughout the nation, are, this is the hot topic today. Um, do you think the rhetoric has influenced judgments and maybe caused politicians and Americans to not necessarily see the facts or even talk to each other to hear different sides um, to maybe possibly come to a compromise to understand the fear the fear someone has of taking away our rights and the fear somebody has against protect. Um, possibly a mass shooting. Yeah, um, and when you say rhetoric, do you mean most, well, I'm guessing everywhere, media, just Media, and especially and the terms we use, gun control instead of gun reform, or pro-gun, anti-gun. Mm -hmm. um, we almost push ourselves to the extremes rather than, uh, I guess, a middle ground. So exactly, and I think, again, it comes down to, is this, I perhaps remember this myself too, is that what we see on TV, what we see in the, even the rhetoric, and or here in the rhetoric, the rhetoric is the five percent on both the extremes, right? On both of the sides that are very loud. Even though they're really small, they're very loud. Exactly. They're also very powerful, and they have exactly. a lot of money. And so that's what we're seeing. We think that that's represent that, that that's representative of of all people. But really, there's a whole bunch um, in the middle, the 90% that's still waiting for someone to, not saying that they can't make decisions for themselves, but for most people, they're, they're living their lives. They're, they're doing what they need to do in, unless something like that happens to them. Um, for the most part, that's when it's too late. So I think that's part of it is that to remember that there are still the 90% of people who maybe they're not watching the news or maybe they're, they're not really keeping abreast on the issues um, and they want someone to tell them uh, and they're not going to listen to people yelling. Um, and when it comes to that, they're just going to shut down. So I think there are advantage, there are opportunities for us to talk to those people and be able to change um, their minds. But I come, it comes down to those people on the five percent on each side who tend to be the politicians, the legislators, uh, the activists, 
um, who do get to make the decisions. So uh, I think it's really it's a lot of the entertainment side of it when it comes down to it. Unfortunately, sometimes they're on our side when it comes down to yes, we're pro gun or not, or no, we're not pro gun. For example, I was really upset to hear that the House Freedom Caucus, um, when uh, Dr. John Lott went to go speak to them, um, was very anti, no, we're not going to arm any teachers. I mean, the House Freedom Caucus. I mean, th those are people that you're thinking, okay, they're definitely going to be on our side. So I think there's still a lot of people within even the, I don't want to say the elite, but the people who are supposed to be making decisions or making laws for us, who, <coughs> who we vote into office, who represent us, um, even they are not educated on the issue. And I think there's a lot of responsibility for us, for we, the people, to be able to educate those legislators and make sure that they're doing the right things. Thank you. Yeah. Yes. Okay. Is it? Sorry. No, they, they can ask a question. Okay. <laughs> Go ahead. Um, thank you for coming. Um, I'm from New York. Oh. Um, and now I'm here, <laughs> not two of the most gun friendly areas, but. Um, it's, I see that it has worked in Texas, um, you were successful there. Um, how do you go about expanding it to other, other schools and other states um, on a governmental level outside of just having um, informed voters? Um, and is there a constitutional problem that you found? It seems to me to restrict somebody in a public, air, in a public school uh, to not be able to carry a gun five feet inside or out, or 150 or whatever the rule is inside or outside of school could have some uh, constitutional problems. When it comes to campuses or yeah, K-12? Yeah, when it comes to campuses, public, especially public school campuses, is there no constitutional problem about <laughs> restricting someone from carrying a gun on public property? Well, so uh, what, for the most part, when it comes to on the books with campus carry legislation um, is that there are there's Arkansas, Kansas, Texas, Georgia, those states where now we're able to carry within the buildings. Um, before Texas um, became a campus carry state, you were able to carry because they had concealed carry. You just had to carry outside the buildings where public land was, right? Um, but you couldn't go inside the building as a law-abiding citizen with a firearm. So that's what a lot of states are dealing with now is that, I mean, if you can't go inside your classroom, then that's where you spend most of your time. You're not really able to actually protect yourself. Um, so the, a lot of those states are really comes down to that. And yeah, I think that's the problem, the issue. That part of the issue is that if you're able to, to defend yourself off campus or off the grounds, or even on grounds, but outside of that building, why can't you get inside and be able to actually defend yourself when you're actually partaking and you know, being able to you know, be educated at the same time? So that's the problem that most states are having is that they already technically have campus carry, but they don't because it's not actually practical for most people to actually implement it in their everyday life. Did I answer your question? Yeah. Okay. I have a question. Oh, yes. Okay, so um, for schools, like I went to Virginia Tech and campus carry is like nobody wants it because the student is the one that turned on the other students. Um, but do you see that like arming professors or arming teachers is a segue into allowing students to protect themselves on campus because I had a few professors when I was in school that were avid um, gun owners, they competed, they were very, um, very knowledgeable and they certainly did want to protect their students if anything happened but they don't have that right on the campus because it's a gun free zone. Um, but I just wondered if there's, if they allow the professors, somebody you're supposed to trust, somebody that you're paying a lot of money to teach you and arm you with knowledge, um, if that might be a segue to allow the students to carry eventually. Yeah, so right now, Tennessee is actually like that, where they have professor carry, basically what they call professor carry, where they don't allow their professors to, or faculty members to be able to carry. I don't really think it's a, I don't think, believe it's a segue, I don't think it should be a segue, I mean, unfortunate that they stopped there at this point. Um, but I think, I mean, like, example Kansas and Arkansas and Georgia that's already doing it so well already um, with the students but I think it comes down to the fact that most concealed carry laws make you have to be at least 21 years of age or older anyways who want to have a permit and so that's really what it come down to that's maybe seniors but mostly graduate students and faculty members and professors 
Um, so, and that's just because it's representative of the state laws. So there are actually a couple of states that do have allow you to conceal carry 18, but for the most part it's 21. So I think with the campus carry law, it just comes down to that's those are the people who are going to be carrying anyways. So you might as well allow students as well to carry. Oh, you have another question? Yes. Um, and that's what's totally okay. Sorry, I didn't mean to be on the spot. So that bill, the concealed carry bill, that would allow, um, say you had a carry permit in one state to be recognized in all 50 states? Reciprocity, yeah. Re yeah, reciprocity. Um, so I was left out of the budget deal, mm -hmm. uh, if I'm not mistaken. So do you think that's going to come back around, possibly? Or is that just probably like gone by the wayside, it's just... Considering that thing yeah, passed the house, but um, yeah, there was a meme within the NRA. They're just like it's going to be dead on arrival for the Senate, um, just because it's the makeup of the Senate. So mm -hmm. and how we have to be able to pass it in a certain way. So um, yeah, basically it's going to have to be something where we do it again and start over. But at, at least we got the house to pass that pass that aspect of it, and I, for the most part, it was the educational side of it of talking to people and having that conversation of, yes, this is a good thing and this is something that can actually happen and having that debate first now publicly so when we are able to, to bring that back up, that more people will be on board. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, I don't think it's o over. We're definitely, NRA and gun owners in general are going to keep pushing for that. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Oh. So, of course, I always have goodies. I'm not really sure. Do you guys know if you guys are not allowed to have pepper spray in your show? I think we're only allowed whistles. Oh, we allow whistles? <laughs> I'm just okay. That up. I have no idea. All right. Well, <laughs> that's another thing is that people, I always, like, I, I always uh, educate people on the fact that uh, most people think that it's always gun free zones and that the school, oh, of course, they would allow you to have other forms of being able to protect yourself. No. Uh, for the most part, most of the schools I've been to, um, I have this really cool, um, it's called the yellow case um, jacket, or yellow jacket, yellow case. Gosh, yellow jacket case, sorry. And basically it's a, a battery charger and a stun gun in one. And I usually give that out when I can, um, except for Massachusetts that completely bans them completely, um, which also bans pepper spray. So that's why I wanted to ask you guys and make sure you guys are okay with that. But um, I want to reward and I'm sorry, fellas. I'm always gonna, I would make this for the for the ladies because why would I start empowered if I was just like, oh yeah, you guys can spend it for yourself. Um, so one lady that was paying attention to one of the facts that I was when I was doing when I was uh, speaking. Um, if one lady can ask or can answer, how many fewer criminal offenses? did University of Kansas report they have after passing the campus carry bill? The number, <laughs> I know it's like, oh, okay. yeah. oh, go for it. 13%? It is 13%. You're it's about right. 100. But it was 100. Good job. <laughs> awesome. You're like, oh. Okay, so <laughs> you get a Kimber Pepper Blaster. Because self-defense is important. But of course, I want you guys to continue to advocate. And if you're not allowed to have that, it's on tape. I'm sorry. But it just shows that Georgetown doesn't care about your, your, your safety. So um, if you can't have pepper spray, Berkeley allows pepper spray. So let's wow. say wow. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You guys don't want to be worse off. Okay. So um, congratulations and thanks for your attention. But thank you guys so much. And this was really great. Thank you.